Sun, water, and slides. A perfect combination for a family fun day. Water parks are a staple of family vacations everywhere. But what happens to these parks when tourism declines? There are no safety measures, and they have bad management. These places become totally abandoned, of course. Today, we're going to uncover the stories behind these deadly and abandoned water parks. Hoi Tui Tien in Hue, Vietnam. Hoi Tui Tien is one of the world's most famous abandoned water parks. It opened back in 2004, and it cost approximately $3 million to be built. Still, when it opened, it was only half to two-thirds completed. The park featured three water slides, an auditorium where performances were put on to entertain guests, and the park's signature giant three-story tall dragon aquarium. Rising from the lake at the park's center, manta rays and sharks lined the walls of the interior staircase, built to resemble a dragon's ribcage. On all sides of the dragon were aquarium tanks full of live fish and crocodiles. Nobody knows the exact reason why, but within just a few years, the business continued to experience problems. Some people say it was because the park was not completed when it opened. Others say that it was because of operating issues or financial ones. After it shuttered, plans to resurrect the park from its physical troubles by turning it into an eco-park swirled throughout Hue's local media as recently as 2013. Instead, those revitalization plans died on the table leaving the park to become a legendary destination for travelers to the region. The worst part of this park's closure was that the crocodiles in the aquarium were left to fend for themselves and made their home in the pools attached to the water slides. And as recently as February 2015, the crocodiles, who by now were in a dreadful state of ill health, were still residing in the pools. Some visitors even fed the crocodiles and also brought them to the attention of PETA. And thankfully, in collaboration with the local authorities, PETA took the crocs out of the pools and moved them to a wildlife park somewhere else in the country. This abandoned park has been popularized as a tourist destination in its own right. Located eight kilometers out of town, the park is not that easy to get to. Once you're there, you can find a guard who collects an admission fee of 44 cents. There are even refreshment carts in operation inside of the abandoned park sometimes. In October 2014, the area was given to the Hui Trading Investment and Construction Group Company Limited. After receiving the project, this unit has planned to rebuild Toi Tian Lake into a high-class ecotourism area, including a conference center, spa services, restaurants, resorts, performing arts, entertainment, and outdoor camping. However, for many years, this work stood still, and the park remains abandoned. Atlantis Marine Park in Two Rocks, Australia. Atlantis Marine Park opened in 1981. This park was envisioned as Western Australia's alternative to the Gold Coast, a region of Australia famous for its beaches. There were hopes that nearby Perth's boom times would attract tourism to this shiny new ocean-themed park. This park featured pools, pedal boats, live dolphin shows, and an iconic 10-meter tall statue of King Neptune holding his triton. Initially, the park was a huge success with families from all over flocking to the park to swim in the pools, ride the boats, take pictures with the iconic statue, and watch the dolphin shows. Initially, the park started with six trained dolphins for the shows, which gave shows for nine years. But then, in 1988, the set grew to nine when three dolphins were born in captivity. The new arrivals created new issues for the park. Regulations for dolphin enclosures had changed, and legislation required the park to build a larger area for the dolphins. This caused a massive debt for the park, which had not proved to be the moneymaker its creators had hoped and was already losing money. So the owners decided to close the park. As part of the park's closing, there was an agreement with research scientist and marine park veterinarian Dr. Nick Gales. In return for releasing the company from its financial obligation to the dolphins, they gave him permission to attempt to reintroduce the wild dolphins and their captive-born offspring back into the wild. The adult Atlantis dolphins had been performing in captivity for almost a decade, and the captive-born juveniles had never hunted in the wild, so this was a difficult task. The dolphins struggled. They quickly lost weight. The group structure broke up. One of the juvenile dolphins was reported to be visiting resorts, trying to interact with people, and nearly beaching itself in the process. Ultimately, three of the dolphins proved to be incapable of living in the wild. They were recaptured and taken to the Aquarium of Western Australia. The fate of the other dolphins is unclear. After February of 1992, none of the wild Atlantis dolphins were ever seen again, though occasional reports come in from local fishers who claim to have run into unusually friendly dolphins in that area. The rest of the park was left completely abandoned. This led to vandalism, 
So most of the park was covered in graffiti, had destroyed walls, and many of the ocean statues were in an awful condition. And having the empty pools and buildings, the park had a desolate environment. In 2011, a petition started going around calling for immediate action from the owners of the park to restore the site. A plan was put forward to the city of Wanneroo to develop the area into a mix of retail, commercial, and entertainment land uses. In the plan, key features of the marine park, such as King Neptune, would be retained. And then, after several months of restoration, the King Neptune sculpture and surrounding area were reopened to the public in May 2015. Le Aquatic Paradis in Sitges, Spain. Back in 1992, Spain was getting ready to host the most important sporting event of the year, the Barcelona Olympics. This event brought significant economic incentives for the different event venues, including Sitges. New developments came to town. One of these was a water park called Le Aquatic Paradis. Sadly, this park was never particularly popular and visitor numbers were low. Sitges had never really been seen as a family resort, and a water park didn't seem to fit with its reputation as a high-end beach destination. Some called it the St. Tropas of Spain. It didn't help that Spain's biggest theme park, Port Adventura, was under construction just down the coast in Salou, and it had firmly placed itself front and center as the family destination of choice within Catalonia. Despite the fact that the number of visitors was small, the park continued to run. However, in 1995, Port Adventura was ready, and it proved to be a serious competitor. The Port Adventura Park managed to establish itself as a favorite destination for families. In its first year of operation, it was visited by 2.7 million people. And facing such tough competition, La Aquatic Paradis made several attempts to survive. The owners tried to get sponsors, laid off staff, and they took on several bank loans. But all that happened was that the water park accumulated more debts than its activities and visitor numbers could pay off. They were also facing major safety issues. Rumors abound to this day about a child being fatally injured after being sucked into the engine of the wave machine. So the park closed its gates, burdened by bad press and even bigger debts. The park was completely abandoned and left to rot. But ironically, as soon as the gates closed, it became a hugely popular counterculture destination because a number of entrances were left open and the park slowly became populated again. Skaters tore across the shallow pools and the steeped up walls while a band who had made the park their practicing area, played loud percussive music. Models even used the abandoned site as a backdrop for a fashion shoot. Graffiti artists have made it their own. It has been the location of music videos and fashion editorials. But suddenly, the entrances were closed and even marked with large police signs that warned that trespassing was illegal. Still, urban explorers continued visiting the park, so police made a final move to try and keep them out. With permission from the owner, the police force began to conduct training operations in the park. So, of course, fewer people dared going into it. Then, in 2006, a company called Atri SA purchased the old park and signed an agreement with the town of Sitges to develop the area. Their grandiose project for the 13.7 acre site was a cultural complex called Parc de les Arts. The plan included a large auditorium, parking, a hotel, residential properties, gardens, and public squares. The Parc de les Arts never materialized. As Spain was hit by the global financial crisis, the park remains abandoned to this day, and sadly, there are no new plans for renovating it. Selva Aquatica in Manzanillo, Mexico. Manzanillo is internationally known for being one of the most important ports for deep sea fishing and sailing. It is known as the sailfish capital of the world, and since 1957, it has hosted important national and international fishing competitions, such as the Dorsey Tournament, making it a very attractive fishing destination. It is also one of the busiest tourist areas in Mexico thanks to its beautiful beaches and natural parks. So in 2010, a group of people decided to open a smaller water park on the outskirts of the city to take advantage of all the tourism this city has and also for the locals. The park was called Aquatic Jungle and it successfully opened in 2011. It had a few attractions and areas, but it was a great park for families because it was fun and it had a very low cost. The park was doing very well and in 2012, it received a renovation. This made it a favorite spot for many of the local families. Unfortunately, the water park was very far from the main city, and people preferred to visit the nearby beaches instead of driving to the outskirts of the city and paying an entrance fee. 
So in 2015, the park closed its doors. The owners put the park up for sale for 12 million pesos, or the equivalent to 567,948 US dollars. But no one decided to buy the park, and so it was completely abandoned. The park is in a terrible state. At the front office, you can find spare tickets for the many attractions lying on the floor. The slides are completely destroyed and vandalized, and the pools are covered in mold and completely drained. In 2017, the government announced a new project for a state-of-the-art water park, but so far, the project has not advanced at all. It's very sad to see a place that was once enjoyed by many families to be in such a state, but thankfully, they can still enjoy all the beautiful beaches that Manzanillo has to offer. Lake Dolores Water Park, Newbury Springs, California. Lake Dolores Water Park in Newbury Springs, California was constructed in the early 1960s by local businessman Bob Byers. In May 1962, a basic campground adjacent to the small lake was opened to the public, and over the next 25 years, rides and attractions were added, and the site evolved into a water park. The water park featured eight identical 150-foot water slides, mounted side by side on a human-made hill. Nearby were two V-shaped water slides. There was also a zip cord ride, three high diving boards, three trapeze-like swings that guests used to launch themselves into the lake, a fast, long group raft ride, a lazy river, bumper boats, an oval jet ski water racetrack, and a swimming pool. The park saw its peak attendance between the early 1970s and the mid-1980s, but after a downturn in popularity in the late 1980s, it closed. Byers sold the defunct park in August 1990 to businessman Terry Christensen, who envisioned a more polished park with a 1950s theme, and the park reopened under a new name, Rockahoola. On July 4, 1998, the park featured the constant playing of 1950s and 1960s rock and roll music throughout the park, along with some compatible graphics. In its Rockahoola incarnation, the park included a river ride on inflated tubes. Things were going good for the park, so good in fact that the 1999 Electric Daisy Carnival was held there. But in its three seasons, the park amassed $3 million in debt. One of the three investors experienced financial problems, and an employee had an accident in which they were awarded $4.4 million in damages. So they filed for bankruptcy in February 2000. Because the court-appointed trustee failed to find a buyer for the park, the bankruptcy judge overseeing the case returned the property to Dolores Buyers, with most debts to discharged. Dolores Byers sold the property in September 2001, and after a $400,000 renovation, the water park reopened in May 2002 under a new name, Discovery Water Park. In 2002 and 2003, the park was open on weekends. During the last season of operation in the summer of 2004, the park operated intermittently. But apparently, things didn't work out because the park has been closed since the summer of 2004. Since then, the park has been used for TV shows, films, music videos, commercials, and there have even been efforts to bring it back to life. But this has been to no avail, and the park remains completely abandoned. In mid-October 2018, the abandoned park was the victim of arson, and many of the remaining buildings, including the Lazy River Cafe and Arcade, were sadly burned to the ground. Nowadays, the water park is still there, completely abandoned in the middle of the Mojave Desert. On March 30th of this year, it was announced that plans to restore the abandoned water park are moving forward. These plans include rehabbing the 41-acre former water park, restoring the 22-acre lake and 2-acre pond for boating, swimming, and camping, an additional office and admission space, commercial and retail. Hopefully, everything goes well with this restoration, and we can get to see this park become alive again. Wet n Wild in Vinland Station, Ontario, Canada Prudhomme's Landing was once one of the biggest recreation and entertainment venues in Ontario. It was a very popular and affordable spot for young people and families, and once saw as many as 7,000 guests per day during its summer operating season. Adjacent to the resort was a recreation center with a snack bar, a nine-hole par-3 mini-golf course, an indoor swimming pool with an underground tunnel to the main hotel, an outdoor pool, an arcade, a bowling alley with four, five-pin auto lanes. There was also an amusement park built nearby. It had go-karts, a haunted house, and many more attractions. All of these were great, but the resort was not done yet. A small water park was later opened. A human-made hill was used to create two water slides, and after, a wave pool, two water slides, a lazy river, and a rapid tube ride were added. This area was called Wet n Wild. This recreation and entertainment complex sadly had a very troubled history. In 1967, a fire destroyed the main section of the complex, including 55 motel suites, the dining room, five ballrooms, a curling rink, and the garden center theater. 
This destroyed the resort and left it with almost no possibilities of coming back to its former glory. Then, a second fire in September 1971 destroyed the indoor swimming pool, bowling alley, and the gaming arcade and the games inside. Police determined the fire to be arson. Still, after all of those problems, the theme park and the water park continued working, at least until 2000. The cost and maintenance of the park were huge, and people stopped visiting the resort, so this made it very difficult to keep the park open. By 2001, the park and its surroundings were completely abandoned and left to rot. The Prodhams Landing Inn closed around 2010, and after it closed, it was also abandoned for six years, until in 2016, everything was demolished. The only thing left after this was the hotel, but this lasted for three months only because it was destroyed by another, you guessed it, fire. This is a very sad story, and it is awful to see that such a successful tourist destination is nowadays in ruin, and will only live in the memories of the people who were once able to enjoy it. So, what do you think? Which one of these did you find to be the creepiest? We're going to be doing a part two of this video, so leave your suggestions of which parks you think we should feature below. See you next time, Duck Squad!